Hello friends, happy Monday and welcome to a very special Shelf Help book club. I'm Tony, your host tonight and founder of the club. And tonight or today in Canada or um, anytime actually, if you're watching us on playback, but very soon I'll be introducing our VIP guest, best-selling author, Jan Martel, the mind behind this extra, extraordinary story of Life of Pi, which has to date sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. And almost as impressive is the shelf help book of the moment for November and December. Uh, Life of Pi is over 20 years old, but its lessons are timeless. And tonight we're going to find out out about the impact that Life of Pi has had on author Jan's own life, as well as unpacking some of the book's biggest themes. So if you're watching live, we have David manning the chat box. So please check in and share any comments there. And because this is a webinar, you also have the chance to share questions directly with Jan. Um, I'll be fielding those, So, um, but wherever possible, I'll, I'll endeavor to get them all answered along with a couple of my own. Um, so welcome, Jan. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you for this wonderful book, which we're enjoying so much as a book club. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be with you. So we have you for one hour tonight, and I know that we know that I already have too many questions, probably, but we'll see how far we get. Um, and before we, we start, I should probably tell you, Jan, and everybody watching, that as a club, we're halfway through the book um, because we're reading it in November and December. So um, probably quite important not to have too many plot spoilers or no plot spoilers. Yeah, so we're about, wow. I think, I, uh -huh. I, didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. All right. Good to know. Yes, indeed. So see if we can reveal a lot without revealing it all, maybe. <laughs> so a little bit about you then first. Um, thank you for being here. So how are you today? Where are you today? I'm well, thank you. My daughter had a migraine, so I didn't have a great night, but whatever, that's the way it goes with parents. Uh, I'm in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So like a lot of places, the proverbial middle of nowhere, but a wonderful place to live. So I'm sort of in Western Canada, what's called the prairies. It's very frat, flat. Very much like like Norfolk, um, flat agricultural province. Um, lovely place to live. I've lived here for 20 years. I'm not here from originally. I'm originally from Quebec, but I traveled around a lot when I was a child. My parents were diplomats. They worked for in Canadian embassies. So I lived in Costa Rica, in France, in Mexico. Uh, but now I'm in, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, it's kind of lunchtime, I think, for you, isn't it? So what does an average day in your life look like generally? Is there an average day? Uh, sorry, let me just plug in my computer. Um, depends what stage I, in my creative process I'm in. I'm in, let's say, if I'm, I do a lot of research for my books. I love doing the research. The idea of just plucking a novel out of my head uh, doesn't happen for me. It's always based on ideas and then research. So um, when I'm in my research phase, probably one of two things. Either I go to a university library, so I might go to the University of Saskatchewan here, which is not very far off from where I live. And I'll go to the university library and type in a topic and I'll look at all the books they have. And uh, as I'm writing, as I'm reading those books, I'll take notes. Um, I also do like research on the ground. I love traveling anyway. But so for my next book, for example, called Son of Nobody to do with the Trojan War, I went to Greece and Turkey. Uh, Turkey, where, of course, Troy is in northwestern Anatolia, just southwest of Istanbul. And then I went to Greece, of course, where the Greeks started from. I went to specifically to Mycenae, to in the northeastern Peloponnese, where uh, a lot of the Greek forces came from. For Life of Pi, I went to India. Um, I was in India traveling anyway when I started the book, so I spent time in the various locations described in the book. And then I did a lot of research on zoos, so I did all kinds of visit all kinds of zoos in India and elsewhere. And um, so research, I do travel, and then I do academic research, and then an average day might be just in my little studio. I'm in my little studio here. It's a tiny little studio with a treadmill desk. So I walk. <laughs> How often type. does that get used? All the time. I've written two books on that, walking miles every day. So I, um, an average day would be I come in here as soon as I can escape my children, and I'll spend a good chunk of the day working at my desk, writing and rewriting. Um, and I love doing that. I'm not a particularly fast writer, so Life of Pi took me about four years to write, two years of research, two, two and a half years of writing and rewriting. Um, it's roughly the same length of time for this next one, the, the Trojan War one. So I work as much as I can. I have no particular schedule. I, I rarely work in the evenings, but I'll work, you know, most mornings, most afternoons until, um, until the children are out of school. Are you a big morning routine person? Um, not particularly. Uh, the only routine I can think of is often before working, I play a game of chess. 
mm. electronic chess on my computer. <clears throat> I'm a terrible chess player. It's not the point of perfecting my skills. I just find when you play a game, you have to focus. So as I start to play this chess game, I'm starting to forget other stuff in my life and I'm focusing on this uh, chess mm. game. And then when I finish the chess game, I transfer my focus from the chess game to my book. Um, and then after that, you know, as I'm working, I'll take a little break to, to, to do emails. But other than that, I just, I just work. It's a very slow, you know, wonderful process, actually. It's a wonderful process writing because you out of nothing you create something out, out of disparate elements mm. that you've assembled you create something and so when the going's good as it was for example with life of pi this novel about zoology and religion all those odd elements came together wonderfully for me so it was actually a very easy novel to write now that one i didn't write here i wrote that when i was living in montreal um but it was a jubilant experience i just loved working on life of pi it all came together um very nicely that's so nice to hear because quite often you hear from writers or you um, maybe we just assume it that writers have um, have a tough time trying to the, the creative process can be seen as quite uh, difficult, I think, for some people. So it's really nice to hear somebody say that they enjoyed writing a book. Hmm. Well, what about it's either, it's either easy or impossibly hard. In fact, if the writing is that hard, it's clearly because there's a problem. I mean, it could be that you're dealing with something emotionally very difficult. I suppose, but otherwise, I think if it's impossibly difficult, it's because obviously you're at a, you're at a dead end, so you have to back up and find an open road. Um, but also, it's just wonderful being in words for someone who likes words. And I said, creating a story is like creating a world. It's just a really, mm -hmm. it's a really satisfying uh, process, uh, especially if you're lucky. As I said, if you're getting rejection after rejection, it'll shake your confidence. But I was lucky that I had quite an easy life. Of Pi was my third book. I had a collection of short stories, a novel, and then Life of Pi. And the first two had, you know, modest sales, good reviews, but very modest sales, which is generally the world of literary fiction. And then Life of Pi did exceedingly well. So it was very gratifying, gratifying, also very, uh, you know, very good for one's confidence as a writer. Not that my subsequent books have done as well, of course. They've had some good reviews. And the next one, Beatrice and Virgil, both the Holocaust, had some very bad reviews in the U.S., because it touched on the Holocaust, which tends to be a very sensitive topic. People feel very mm -hmm. uncomfortable talking about the Holocaust, whereas they're not, they're not uncomfortable talking about war, for example. Let's take the Ukraine-Russian war. People talk about it all the time and utterly confident about their point of view. It's funny how the Holocaust, people get very, very nervous. So because of that, it had some very bad reviews, but well, that's the way it goes, you know? Yeah, I suppose you learn, um, you learn not to take things personally. Well, you have to, um, I guess so, yeah, you have to let go. You just have to let go. Yeah, you know, when you write, when you create something, it's a gift to the world. and You hope your gift is gratefully received, but if it's not, what can you do? Mm -hmm. This one sure is. Um, at, at Shelf Help, really the whole reason for this book club existing is to help us change, like understand, I suppose, and then change if needed or improve the relationship we have with ourselves. So I love to ask guests, how would you sum up your relationship with yourself at the moment? Is there one word or two words that you could use? Well, I'd say it's good. I mean, I, um, life is a challenge. Um, um, you know, I'm 59, so, you know, my, my retinas are a bit ragged. You know, as we age, things start to go south. So my retinas are a bit, I see a eye doctor every six months says, oh, your retinas are very ragged. There's always a word he uses, they're ragged. So I have to ragged. live with my ragged retinas, you know, always in mild, mild fear of that I'll get retinal detachment and I must rush to a hospital to have it reattached. Um, but I'd say generally my life is good. As I was just telling you before we started, my next novel was turned down by every single American publisher because it's quite experimental in format. It's this novel in verse and footnotes. So it divided in half pages in the top, top half, you have these verses, these invented verses of Greek epic and then on the bottom half, you'll have footnotes. So it's quite an unusual format. It is still completely a novel. It's not a work of academia, but the format was quite um, challenging for American editors. So they all, every single one turned it down, which has been disheartening. But as I said, you know, you have one chance to live. Uh, if I didn't want to do this, I wouldn't do it. I'd do something else. I still like doing it. So generally I'd say I'm content with my life. I accept the challenges and I'm grateful for the good things that have happened to me. Mm, that's a great answer. How would you say your relationship with um, Pi is now in this book? Has it, it's, like it's 21 years, I think, isn't it, since it's been released? So how do you feel about this book and how and what it's 
what it did for your life has done for your life and where it's taken you? Well, considering I wrote it thinking it would possibly not be accepted for publication and be liked by very few people, because as you're only halfway through it, but it's a novel about religion. There's also a lot about zoology and most people don't like zoos. Most urban novel readers would consider zoos to basically be jails for animals. And that the animals in there are imprisoned and, and somehow are unhappy, which is not a, I mean, that might be a reflection of bad zoos, but it's not a reflection of a good zoo. Of course, a good zoo is still a compromise, the best place for animals mm -hmm. would be wilderness. Although in wilderness, you have to survive predators and you have to find food, um, which, I mean, you know, uh, dictates a certain level of perpetual stress, which is absent in the zoo where animals are safe and fed. Then there's other challenges, of course, you don't want animals to get bored. But the art and science of zookeeping has evolved greatly and a great zoo is an extraordinary thing. It's like an embassy from the wild. But anyway, that's, I'm saying that having done my research, most people don't like zoos. And also this novel touches on religion and it's not dripping in irony. It's not looking to see what is utterly true in organized religion, the patriarchy, the sexism, the homophobia, the anti-Semitism, all of that is completely true. I live in Western Canada where we've discovered recently how the Catholic church basically murdered children, abused children in these residential schools they were called and they were found, it started in Kamloops where 215 graves were found of children who had been basically died of neglect and abuse under the Catholic church. So it's an institution that not only, you know, uh, uh, marginalizes women and gays and uh, oppressed Jews, but now murdered children. So I've no interest in, in organized religion. My character, Pi, as you will have seen in this novel, is genuinely faithful. That's what interested me in this novel, is that curious little phenomenon called faith, whereby we believe in things for which we have no tangible empirical proof. You know, you wear a seatbelt in a car, not because it's comfortable particularly, because it has been shown through research that it will save your life if you have an accident. Well, there's no such proof that believing in God will save your life if you have an accident. There's no proof. You just have this thing called faith, which is a very unusual uh, phenomenon if you look at it uh, uh, closely. But it's the one that is the operative um, word for all of us. We all have to have some sort of faith, whether you call it love. Uh, it's usually called love, whether it's love of a person or religion or of a sports mm -hmm. team or a cause. That's the real motor of life. Um, rationality is a very powerful tool, but it is just a tool. Before you grab that tool, you have to have a reason to use it. And that reason is usually in, imbued with faith. So here I, I want to look at religious faith, which once again, for your average urban novel reader, certainly in Canada, that person is not usually religious. Um, hardcore religious people have no use for fiction because they have their God and that's fiction enough for them. That's belief enough for them. So here I was taking on too what I thought, especially from Quebec where I was, which is a very, very secular province. I was taking on religion and zoology two unpopular themes. So I wrote this book because I loved it. I was so uh, taken by it. And then I was absolutely gobsmacked that it did as well as it did. It started well enough in Canada. Most people couldn't quite place it. It had this feel of this adventure story, had this perhaps feel of a YA, you know, young mm -hmm. adult, because it features a teenager, although frankly, there are teenagers all over the world. They're surrounded by adults and, you know, but anyway, it, uh, so it did well enough. It was nominated for a few prize, but then it really started to take off when it appeared in the UK and in the US. And I was, I still am surprised and delighted. I'm still grateful for the success of the book. I'm grateful that people open themselves up to it. One worry I had, for example, is Pi is a boy, is a boy. the tiger is a male tiger and the whole setup of a survival story, I thought it's too masculine. I don't mean to write a masculine story, but it has this feel of a sort of a Tarzan story, which was not my interest at all to have a sort of particularly male story, but because the sensibility of the story is not at all masculine. Uh, and I was grateful at how many, you know, women uh, uh, turned to it. So um, yeah, I'm very grateful that people opened themselves to it. And they really did. I remember the novel was especially popular rather randomly in Korea. Mm. Now, I've never been to Korea. I have no link to Korea. Why would Koreans particularly like Life of Pi? But they really, really did. And so for that, I'm still grateful that these books can create bridges to such foreign cultures, to people from such a different experience of life, that they can still read Life of Pi and make it their own. So I, mm -hmm. I'm still grateful for the book. It's overshadowed me. I'm sort of a one hit wonder, which is fine. Better to have one hit than no hits at all. And um, I've continued working on different books. So Life of Pi for much of me is very much the past. Although I say that there's a play of it in London now and it's starting up in Boston and then in March of the next year, it'll be opening up on Broadway. So, you know, it's still 
still 20 years on, it's still, it's still a going concern. Yeah, and what I found with the book club is that different, it's all different generations are enjoying it, did enjoy it, are enjoying it again. People often revisit it. We have loads of, um, we have a lot of uh, teachers and counselors and therapists in our, within our community. And a lot of them have read it already, or it's on, it was, it's on the list because of, um, because of the themes it covers. So I suppose it's, it's this, it's the idea of storytelling, isn't it? That's, that's universal, the power of story and the importance of that. So, um, that's also probably what do, also what you do with suffering because that's the interesting thing about <clears throat> religion as i said there's so many things wrong with organized religion but the idea of religion is that it's a it's an extraordinary tool for digesting suffering in a completely secular world where you just believe in the chemical material reality around us um there's nothing to be done with suffering suffering hurts and that's it it basically defeats mm -hmm. you if you have a child and that child dies a horrible death in a completely secular world there's nothing, you cry a lot, you're a broken machine for the rest of your life. There's no mechanism for dealing with suffering. What's interesting about, I mean, you can have art, for example, you could you know, write a poem about your child or write songs about your child, but that doesn't really deal, deal with the, that's a reaction to the suffering. It doesn't actually deal with it. What's interesting about religion is that it puts suffering in a greater context, which doesn't really hold up to pure rationality, but we're not talking about the rational. Suffering has nothing mm. to do with the rational. So, so it's something about religion is that it puts suffering in a greater context. It basically says that suffering is a little dab of black paint on a much greater can canvas of which the divine has a notion of what that great canvas is. And in that great canvas, you need those little dabs of black. And what's interesting about people who suffer, in fact, one of the starting um, moments for this, for this novel for me, was a horrible story in British Columbia in Victoria, which is this sort of sleepy little capital full of old people. There's a story of um, a young woman named Rena Virk who was murdered by her friends. And the, the lead murderer was this girl. And Rena Virk, I think was 16 years old and a, another 16 year old, a girl, they, she and a, a few friends beat her and then left her to drown. Mm -hmm. Horrible enough. Imagine you're the parents of that girl. What do you do with that? That her friends murdered her. But what amazed me is I read uh, two days after her body was found, her parents put out a, a, a word through the whoever saying, we forgive her killers. And I was thinking, what parent could say two days after your, da your daughter's body has been found, we can forgive her killers? I thought that was an extraordinary reaction so soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that the parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. So this odd little weird Christian sect. But my reaction was, wow, any kind of belief system that could make people say that has got to have something going for them. You can maybe mm -hmm. say they're deluded, but who are we to say that? They're the ones suffering. So I, it just struck me that religion can do that. So one of the themes I wanted to look at in Life of Pi is the, th the theme of suffering, is what do we do with suffering? What are the tools we have for it? So of course there is storytelling, which weaves things into a coherent whole. Life is otherwise sometimes quite meaningless. Storytelling inherently imposes order on, uh, on reality. And there's a benefit to that, but you have to do it artfully. You have to do it well. And so, one of the questions from uh, one of our book clubbers actually was the idea of why use three of the big religions, the three big religions, um, bringing them together and why and having him believing in all of these religions, having a family that believed in none, and then the bringing of them all together when they, the three, um, the, the, lead, the leaders or his teachers, when they all meet, we love. Um, but the, so is that because each religion has its own idea of how to deal with suffering and its own it's and and ultimately it's about the belief that that is a comfort well i did that for a number of reasons first of all just to i didn't want pi to practice only one religion because certainly in north america if you have someone says jesus said everyone flees the room i mean if you're some texas evangelical fine but everyone else starts running away because if Jesus says you can see a middle-aged white American male with his guns. Um, there's something that the, 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 the message of Jesus of Nazareth has been so perverted by people, as religion often is. So if Pi were Christian, first of all, it would make him unrepresentative of Indians. Christianity, of course, exists in India, but it's a tiny minority. It's about 30 million people, which is basically the population of Canada, but is nothing in that enormous country called India. So it would make him unrepresentative. Um, if you were only, mm -hmm. only, but if you were just a Hindu, 
fine. The problem is Hinduism, most non-Indians know nothing about Hinduism. It's a vaguely folkloric, colorful religion practiced far away. They know nothing about it. So that's a, that's a difficulty. <clears throat> and if you were Muslim, well, Muslim Islam, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have kidnapped Islam and done horrible things with it. So if you were just Islam, I was very, that's, a, that's a, a, a barrier to really overcome to make Islam, even though it's nothing inherently violent with Islam, it's a remarkably egalitarian religion. Of course, there's a cleave between men and women, but that's for them to resolve. And, you know, there's a lot to Islam. In fact, of all the religions that I looked at, there was a lot about Islam that, I, that really appealed to me. It's profound egalitarianism. It's a very simple religion. It's like the rules of chess. Chess is very simple rules, but it yields a very complicated game. Islam is like that. Whereas Christian theology is just, you know, there's the unity, there's the trinity. Is there one God? Is there three? What's, it's just, it's just very hard to make sense of. But the interesting about Christianity is the personality of Jesus. What's interesting about Christianity is that the divine is incarnate as a human being. And no other religion does that quite to that extent. Mm -hmm. In Hinduism, you have Krishna, who very much feels like Christ. He's humble. He associates with everyone. He's forgiving. He's kind. He's loving. But he's still divine. You're not going to put a nail in the arms and the legs mm -hmm. of, of Krishna. You know, he's still utterly divine. Um, so there's a humanity to Jesus. There's a complexity to his personality that is endlessly challenging, and which is very, why it's very easy to sort of kidnap Jesus, because he's hard to understand, therefore you can misunderstand him. Um, but there's a simplicity to, to, to Islam. There's a lovely mythological complexity to, to Hinduism. Hinduism, in some extent, is like the Greek myths. The Greek myths are wonderful maps of the human psyche. Hinduism is like that, too. It's an extraordinary, heterogeneous religion. Um, so they all had their appeal. So I wanted, uh, the reason I had Pi practice three religions is I didn't want to him to come off like a fundamentalist. And if you practice three, what that did is that it relativized organized religion, which is why I have that scene with the three quote wise men, just have these fools poke at each other, forgetting that mm -hmm. it's at the core of religion is faith, which is love. I mean, every religion at its core has this notion of love and joy. And that's what I wanted to explore, not these white males, you know, not these males dominating the world. So I wanted to do that. I also wanted to discuss religion just to sort of say, these are the things we're dealing with when you talk about religion. It's very easy to pick at religion. I did that. I come from a completely secular background. My parents left the Catholic Church when they were teenagers because they could, and they never returned. They're from a whole generation of Quebecers who loathe the Catholic Church. All they see is the patriarchy, the sexism, which was rampant in Quebec. It stagnated that society for so long. Um, I wanted to get beyond that, see at the positive things, and leave behind mm -hmm. the negative. Because you can, you can always find what you don't like in a religion. That, you know, if you're a woman, you'll find the sexism. If you're gay, the homophobia, et cetera. That's not what I wanted to discuss. That's there. Everyone knows that. It's why it still endures, why you still to this day have people who will believe in gods. And that's actually quite a beautiful thing. It's a lovely way of thinking because you go beyond the rational, which you ultimately need to do because life is not a rational proposition. Mm. And so before you start, started the research for this particular book, you say you were secular because your parents had kind of fled the Catholic religion and not found another one. Um, did, does, does diving into research like this, has it changed, did it change you? Did it change um, how you, your religion? Absolutely, as I said, I had none whatsoever before that. I was one of those fierce atheists. I remember once when I was a teenager, I went to visit my grandmother, who was your standard issue Catholic, not only religious, but cultural from deep as dark as Quebec. And I remember reducing her to tears by basically tearing apart her faith, which I now am ashamed of. What, what's the point of that? She believed mm -hmm. it, she harmed no one. Um, uh, so it has completely, in a sense, I still cannot abide organized religion uh, or certainly the bad things that it does. And they're pretty constant. Um, they're pretty constant, the bad things that organized religion does. But religious thinking, the idea of faith, I don't see why people wouldn't explore that. It's not a question of accepting it wholesale. It's just being in dialogue with it. So atheists, because as I say in the novel itself, atheism is another kind of belief. To say there is nothing is as much an assertion of a dogma as to say there is everything. The, the only mm -hmm. attitude you might want to have, the only one that's sort of tenable rationally is agnosticism. Because after all, if, if, if the claims of religion the existence of various prophets, the claims of miracles, the, 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 the history of, of, of centuries of belief, if all that is not enough to convince you, what will? So agnosticism, you know, makes sense, 
But if all that can't convince you, what will? To me, life is about making decisions. You either believe or you don't. And to sit on the fence like agnostics do, to me, is ultimately unsatisfying because it's basically mm -hmm. sitting on the fence. It's waiting your whole life for more evidence. And as I said, there's no evidence that can satisfy you. So you decide one way or the other. So either you believe in something or believe in nothing. There's nothing wrong with believing nothing. You people usually substitute, as my parents did, they substituted art for religion. I was, in my entire childhood, I was, you know, given books, dragged to churches, and uh, sorry, dragged to museums. I said, you know, mm -hmm. the, the way to explore life is through art. Read great novels, listen to great music, see great paintings, which is totally true. That is a good way to explore life, but it doesn't explain it. It doesn't give a context to it. Um, so that was why people become environmentalists or become Manchester United fans, whatever. They find some belief system for them. So you have to believe in something or you believe in nothing. So you choose one or the other. And to me, it's just a richer thing to believe in something. And then the real question is, what do you believe in? If you're going to grant that there's more to life than rationality, what is there? And then you can pick and choose. Then you can go to, you know, go to Buddhism, go to Islam, go to something, or just take mm -hmm. on Jesus. If you're a Western, if you're from the Western culture, which is usually more familiar with Jesus, you know, take on Jesus and make him your own. And, and that's what, in fact, most people do. I, you know, as far as I know, most people, if they bother themselves, go to church, they pick and choose. They will go mm -hmm. to church, but still use contraceptives. If their 14 year old daughter gets pregnant, they'll likely get her a, a, an abortion. And, you know, they'll live with it somehow, but you want to be in dialogue with it, because that to me is more enriching than just believing in nothing or just going through your life, not really answering the question at all. Yeah, I suppose if as an agnostic, then you don't really find out until it's too late, right? <laughs> Either <Exactly>. way. <laughs> exactly. And do you think you can be spiritual without being religious? Because I yeah, think I, I feel like a lot of people, there's a spirituality to people now, maybe, and they wouldn't necessarily call themselves religious. Yeah, I, I meant the word religious in the broad sense, encompassing mm. things like spirituality. But the thing is, you don't quite, I mean, I said people pick and choose. You don't want to have too much the cafeteria approach of you pick and choose too much, because otherwise all you do is increase your ego. If it's all about your decision that you will believe in this, but not this because it doesn't suit you, at mm. one point you're just catering to your own narrow selfish vision of things you do have to get out of yourself religion and i said i use the a small art of the broadest sense of the word does ask you to step out of yourself in the very least, least way for example of looking after others all religions are social religion is a profoundly social phenomenon you mm -hmm. you 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 must help others you must love others you must not judge others that all demands work so you know, religion isn't just about liking people like yourself. It's about liking people who are in some ways unlikable. It's reaching out. It's being humble. It's one thing I love about Islam, for example, is the way they pray. You know how they get on their knees and they put their, the reason they put their forehead to the ground is a sign of modesty. You know, I am little, I'll put my forehead to the ground. Mm. And that modesty to me is important for all of us. We don't want to become arrogant. So if you pick and choose too much, it caters to a certain arrogance. Um, mm -hmm. You do want yeah. to become modest and open yourself up to mysteries. Yeah. And and service, I suppose, a lot of the of that bit religion is a lot about being in service, yeah. isn't it? So that yeah. and that comes into being humble. Um, so the religion and zoology, two themes, two of the two of the, the big themes of the book. And did you come? Did you decide on the themes before you decided to base the book in India, or was India always the starting point? It was the starting point because I was in India. I'd been to yeah. India once before. I was chasing after this girl. And she was going to India and she invited me to all about India. I knew nothing about India. I, I mean, I'd read the odd Anglo, you know, Indian novel, E.M. Forrest or those, but the country meant nothing to me. I didn't was quite aware where the cities were in relation to each other. <clears throat> but because of this girl, I went to India and it didn't work out with the girl, but I fell in love with India. Mm -hmm. India is such an extraordinary country. It's the world's largest democracy, um, a flawed democracy, of course, like they all are, look at England. Um, but it's, uh, it's an extraordinary country. As I often say, it's all of life in one moment in one place. It's extraordinarily diverse in terms of religions, languages, musics, the way they dress, the way they eat. It's, a, it's an extraordinary circus. So I, I was dazzled by it. And one of the things I noticed when I was there, especially, and so I went back a second time, meaning to work on another novel. I discussed it in the foreword of Life of Pi, this novel set in Portugal, which in fact became the High Mountains of Portugal, a subsequent novel. Okay. But I went there meaning to work on this novel. It didn't work out. And I went to India only because it was a cheap place for a Canadian to be. I thought, I'll be in this exotic setting. It'll stimulate my imagination. I'll write my Portuguese novel. Well, that didn't work out. So I threw out the, I mailed the Portuguese novel back to myself. I didn't mail it to Siberia. 
And then I was in India. Well, what am I in India for? I, didn't, I wasn't meant to be traveling. I was meant to be working and establishing my life. I was in my late 20s. I need to get a life going here. And so it wasn't, the novel wasn't happening. So I was stuck in India. I didn't have much money at the time. So the airfare was a lot of money. So I just was in India and I opened my eyes and I, I noticed religion everywhere. And mm. because they were mostly exotic religions to me, um, you know, Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism, these are religions that had never particularly bothered me intellectually because I knew nothing about them. So I started noticing aspects of it that were quite endearing. First of all, the kindness of religious people. Most people who take religion seriously are kind people. Islam is a very, very social religion. They're incessantly praying together. And it, so they're very welcoming. And um, Hindus have these massive festivals. So I just started noticing religion and I became intrigued by it. And so I, the best way for me to understand a question is to write a story about it. To, and in a story, you pretend to be that character. So I posited Pi. And I thought to myself, what would it be like to have faith? What would it be like to do that thing that until now I dismissed entirely? What would it be like to, be, to believe in Krishna, in Allah, in Jesus? What would that mean? So because I was in India, I started going to churches, mosques, and temples. And I saw the positive aspect of religion. And so it started mm -hmm. because I was in India. I spent six months in India that time doing research um, about where Pai lived in Pondicherry, visiting zoos, incessantly going to churches, temples and mosques and even synagogues, uh, uh, imbuing myself in that point of view. And as I said, putting aside the stuff I didn't like, like India, of course, has the caste system, which is mm -hmm. like apartheid made religious. Uh, I was ignoring that. Surely there's more to it than hatred in religion. So it was that the loving aspect of religion that I started living. So it started with that, with going to India and uh, the religions are ones that exist in India. And then I returned back to Montreal, and that's when I started doing this more academic research about shipwrecks and about, uh, about zoology. Mm. And the way you're talking about how you were like diving into India and into religion there, it's the wonder of a tourist, isn't it? It's the kind of the new, yeah. everything's new and interesting. And something we commented on um, in our last book club actually was the, the way, because it's written from the voice of a child, it's so simplified and and it is pretty joyous and 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 it's really it makes it easy to understand and easy to talk about as well. I think. Well, that's one. That's one reason I put Pi as sixteen and then seventeen is I wanted mm. someone who was young enough because that's the wonder of being young. When you're young, mm. you're still open. The sadness of becoming a grown up is we tend to become so cynical. Now it's a way of dealing with the world. It's a vast, complicated world. Some parts of it are scary. So the best way to block it out is to disbelieve, to push out, to dehumanize. So mm -hmm. I wanted a, a character who was still open the way few of us as adults are. At one point in, in, as an adult, we make decisions. As I said, atheists, you know, people make decisions and they're clear cut and that sort of defines them. And sometimes that's useful. You can't be per perpetually in a state of wonder. That'd be quite paralyzing, but you don't want to entirely lose your sense of wonder. And religious people, I find those who really are religious can regularly access that sense of wonder. Um, because after all, what's wonderful being, and I'll just use the example of, of Christianity, just because I imagine most of our readers are vaguely familiar with Christianity. If you do it properly, the wonder of going to church on a Sunday is you delve into a text. It's like a book club. Now you're doing the same book every week, but it's a, it's a book that has endured the ages. That's a curious book with a lot of stories in it, very ambiguous messages. It's quite a complex novel. So mm -hmm. every week you go to this book club and at the book club you Tony the priest you discuss this book and you guide the thinking of this book and it enriches you as we all know being part of a book club is, is really really enriching well in a sense according to Christianity to church on Sundays is like participating in a book club and it mm. really nourishes you and a good sermon when I went back to Montreal I said I, okay, I need to find now a, a church to go to to sort of pretend, pretend like I, I believe this stuff. So I found myself a good Catholic church, good in the sense that the, the, the two priests there are so straight from the message of Rome, mm. since there were lots of gay members in the congregation that did not bother them. They were not there to condemn anything. They were there to try to be Jesus-like in their sense of forgiveness mm. and opening people up. They're just amazing, sort of what, uh, one of them was of French origin, what used to be called a, a working class priest, one who went out to the working class in France. So he was not there to dogmatize. He was there to try to humanize. So they gave illuminating sermons. And a sermon, a good sermon is a wonderful thing because it's neither entertainment, um, 
but nor is it, a, you know, a, just a lecture. It's supposed to be, because after all, that's one thing that's also interesting about religion, unlike science, is religion is intensely personal. Every religion, you matter to God. You as an individual, your actions matter to God. If you are good, you will be rewarded. If you are bad, you will be punished. You as an individual matter. Whereas in science, for example, science, it doesn't matter. You know, whether you are alive or not, F will still equals MA. E will still equals MC squared. The formulas of science are there regardless of whether you're there. There's something deeply impersonal about science, um, which is not the case with religion. So a good sermon speaks to you directly and it's supposed to be engaging, so to some degree entertaining, but also uplifting. So it's quite a magical, complicated thing to get. And when well done, and these people did well so often, it was quite uplifting. It really, mm. and in a sense, opened you up uh, uh, and gave you that sense of wonder that I think uh, you know, a good book will do. Mm. Um, so you touched there on the idea of um, religion versus science, not versus science, but religion and science um, obviously are our main character has a has a scientific name so we weren't i'm wondering is there an explanation behind that is there um is yeah, there a there secret is, um, <laughs> i wouldn't say there's an opposition any religion that disregards science is bad religion you know there's there's nothing wrong with science it's wrong with what you can do with science you can drop a nuclear bomb which is not great science or great religion um, but any religion that does not recognize the truths of science, like Bishop Usher, good old foolish Bishop Usher, who said the earth was 6,000 years old. I mean, my God, what a fool. Um, you got to accept if you're religious that the earth is millions of years old and that no, it was not created in one day. If you know, you have to accept Genesis as metaphor. Um, it's a question mm -hmm. of how you apply metaphors. After all, even in art, metaphors are true. They're a way of accessing truth. They just use fiction to get to the truth. So you have to read your religion, not in a literal way. Um, so you have to accept science. Now, Pi, yes, um, what I like about, well, first of all, his full name is Piscine Molitor Patel, which happens to be a pool I used to swim with when I, went, when I lived in Paris. I lived in Paris as a child. But um, a swimming pool traditionally is a rectangular space. It's rational. I like this boy who's named after a rational or rectangular volume of water ending up in the Pacific, which is not a rectangular body of water. Mm. Um, but also Pi, as we all know, is an irrational number. In other words, it goes on forever without any repetition. It's what's in mathematics called an irrational number. And yet that irrational number is used all the time in science to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. Just as religion doesn't make sense, it's an irrational number, but it helps make sense of things. Someone who properly applies religion has the right approach to life of both giving themselves to it and yet being happy despite the sufferings. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. use of the irrational and the rational. So pi, piscine, to me, was encompassing both of those. Um, uh, also, what I liked, and it's funny, this is one of the wonders of, of, of the reader bringing books, things to a book. Um, so pi is in the Pacific, I'm not ruining anything by saying this, but he's in the Pacific for 227 days. Why 227 days? Well, details matter to me. So he had to be you know, inevitably a castaway is at sea for a number of days, whether it's 14, 22, 700, it has to be a number. So mm -hmm. if I choose, what number could I choose? And so I chose 227 because it is a prime number. In other words, it is a number that is divisible only by itself and by one. You cannot divide 227 by three or five or nine or two. That's called a prime number. And the metaphor, the metaphor behind that is uh, in, in I didn't want the cafeteria approach to life of pi. I didn't want you to pick and choose. I don't want to reveal too much here, but I wanted us a, a number that was solid. You could not divide it up. In the mm -hmm. same way, when you finish life of pi, I did not want things to be broken up. So I wanted a prime number. But one of reader that I met said, you, your, your castaway is at sea for 227 days. Why is that? And I said, oh, it's a prime number. She said, oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't know. But did you know that 22 divided by seven is pi. 22 divided by seven is the fraction that is the closest to the number pi, 3.14. And that I hadn't realized, I hadn't noticed that. So it's just, it's into these little things that you write, you have your ideas and other people bring their ideas and that makes it their novel. This one reader, it was her novel because she'd seen that two and 22 over seven is pi and that's the character's name. So it was just an interesting little coincidence there. Yeah, um, incredible synchronicity. We love those. Um, let's talk a little bit then about when this, the novel comes to life. So I think you said it took four years to write, did you? Yeah. Yeah. So 
So you spend four years writing it. And then can you just talk us through a little bit, if, if you remember, if you recall the process of how it get, how the manuscript goes from some, a kind of a, a finished product in your eyes through to being um, signed, launched, released to the world, and then, and then just goes on to this huge success. So that process for you, how, what, how were those elements for you? Well, the editorial process was quite easy. As I said, the novel fell into place quite easily. The only, if um, there's one scene in the novel that your readers probably haven't read yet, there's an encounter in the Pacific at one point. And in the original draft, it was too long. It was like 50 pages. And my editor said, you know what? It's great, but it sounds like Samuel Beckett in the Pacific, which is great. Samuel Beckett is great, but it's too long. It's starting to, it's starting to feel like something else. So that one I had to radically shorten. But that was the only sort of editorial process. So I finished the book, now publishing is slower, but I finished it, it was put to bed, it's sort of May, then it came out, famously for me, it came out on September 11th, 2001, mm. in Canada. It came out in Canada the day of the disaster in wow. New York, yeah. I, in fact, I was in New York on September 10th. I left September 10th precisely because my book was coming out, so I had to be in Toronto for the launch of my book. So I woke mm -hmm. up in the morning and everyone was watching TV and I said, why is everyone watching TV? And the towers, one of the towers had been struck, the other one hadn't been struck yet. Wow. And so out of the rubble of that Twin Towers, my book was born you know, like a phoenix. So, um, well, it came out and, you know, uh, I did some little interviews. I published two books before. So I was very moderately, modestly known in Canada by people who followed Canadian literature. So, you know, you do interviews, you do a few radio interviews, a few television interviews, a few print interviews, and then, you know, you sort of hope for the best. And great books, I think, get known, or sorry, books become popular because of word of mouth. Ultimately, it's word of mouth. One person reads it, likes it, passes it on to someone else. Mm -hmm. And that sort of started happening in Canada. It started doing well. It got nominated for the Governor Generals. But then when it came out in the US and the UK, as I said earlier, then it really started taking off. I said word of mouth took out took off because you know what's interesting about life of pi and i say this whether you like it or not is people seem to have a lot to say about it there's good yeah. books that i love you know disgrace by jm curtsy it's a fantastic book do i have a lot to say about it not really it's just a really really good book and then i mm. see life of pi even if you didn't like it you'll have a lot to say about it you know so it just it happened to be a book that engendered a lot of conversation um and so that conversation has kept on going so what happened well it is it came out in canada in the u.s then I got nominated for the Booker, and I was like, oh, wow, the Booker, that's great. That's as high as I'm going to get, you know, it'll be long listed. And then, oh, it's short listed. Oh, I'm going to London. And then it won. And then it just, yeah, it just took off. That, that little, the Booker helped push it to the next level. And so it did extremely, extremely well in, in, um, in the US and the UK and has continued. And then there was a movie, as, as some of us know, there was a movie done on it. And then I said, now this play. So the dialogue is Katian, and now it's sort of something else. I've moved on to, I've written two, three other books since then. And periodically I'm brought back to, to, to Life of Pi. But that doesn't matter. you back in. <laughs> yeah, One of the questions actually some, somebody's asked is um, if you're involved at all, or if you were involved in developing the script for the, um, the movie or the play. Not the movie, because, um, because the making of movies is extraordinarily complicated. And you don't want when you're a director to have the author nagging you about whether he or she likes the script. So, and anyway, when you, when Hollywood buys a script, it's like when you buy a car, you can drive it off the lot. And what you do with your car after that is your business, no longer mm -hmm. a salesperson's business. So if you want to drive your car into a tree, you go ahead, it's your car now. Same thing when Hollywood buys a book, they do what they want with it. And the worst comes is that you either have the author who doesn't like it or the people who've read the book will say, hey, that's not at all what the book is like, you know, but they, so they bought it. I did have some conversations with the director, with Ang Lee. I did mm -hmm. read the script, but I restricted myself to very modest changes to do with language. You know, neither Ang Lee nor the, the screenwriter, David McGee, had been to India. So I'd correct little turns of phrase that to me didn't sound Indian. Not that I'm an expert on Indian English, but, it, you know, I just, but I didn't make any big picture suggestion because I just figured I'd you know even though I, like all of us of a certain generation you grow up watching movies um I so told myself I'm not a filmmaker I should respect their ability and even though I ultimately found the movie was beautiful to watch but had a lot of I didn't find the script was that strong now if you've read mm. the book you fill in the holes in the movie but if you haven't read the book I didn't find the screenplay the, 
movie was as satisfying in terms of making you think. If you haven't read the book and you see the movie, it's basically just a story about one boy's triumph over adversity. And there's mm-hmm. not much more to it than that. The two, okay. uh, I don't want to reveal too much, but there's not as, it, all the rumination in the book doesn't appear on the screen. Um, the play is, I would say, much better. The play that is just finishing up in London, it started in Sheffield, then went to London, and now it's going to Boston, then New York. It's a much better reflection of the book. Obviously, the book is obviously better. I'm not saying that because I wrote it, just it's the original product, right? Yeah. Um, the play is has all the magic of theater and reflects more of the um, of the of the, the thought behind the story. Uh, and were you involved with the with with the creating the script, of that? Lolita Chakabarty did the screenplay. Yes, we we. I, first, I had a really good conversation with her. I discussed my vision of the book. And she showed me, and so there it was, I wouldn't say it was collaborative because I had to respect her talent as an adapter and her name mm-hmm. goes to it. But there, there was more of a dialogue there because uh, it's interesting in cinema, the screener is at the bottom of the ladder. In, in theater, the screener, the script writer is much, much higher up. The right, okay. and stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. So she had much more uh, of a role and therefore my conversation with her had a much more, had much more consequence. Mm, sure. Um, and and how do you, what was the epitome of success for you? Was it getting to top of the bestsellers, like the New York Times bestseller? Was it selling a million copies? Was it um, seeing it in a book, in like all over the bookshops? Like what, as an author, is there a well, feel, is there a time when you really feel like this? Oh yeah, I've made it. Yeah, well, when you start writing your first success of just being published, so I remember being thrilled by my book. So when Life of Pi came out, it has such a lovely cover, right? The British cover is lovely. So yeah. is the Canadian. There was that. And then, yeah, winning the Booker, that was that was pretty special. I'm not going to be saying it was lovely winning the Booker Prize. It's a great it's a stroke of luck that is, is life-changing and very gratifying. But really, if you ask, it's certainly not the money or the idea of being famous, because that's external. That doesn't change you who are on the inside. I'd say the most touching things was um, readers, readers who wrote to me. Mm. Um, I've, I've done loads. I've, for two years, I basically traveled the world with Life of Pi. So meeting readers was interesting. But more touching was people who bothered themselves to write. You know, they write to the publisher of my book in Australia, and that Australian publisher sends it to my agent in mm. Toronto, who sends it to me in Saskatchewan. So I had these letters that really kind of traveled the world. And there, you know, it's something people, you know, they, they open yourself up to your book, they love it, and they bother themselves to write to you. And those letters are often very touching. You know, after all, I said, life pies about what we do with suffering. The number of people who took on the metaphor, the central metaphor of being on this lifeboat and with a certain character, they take it on and, and reflect on their own lives. You know, people who are living with cancer. One woman I remember wrote to me which she went on a holiday to Belize and she was kidnapped by the taxi driver and held and raped for several days by him. And she took on the central metaphor of life of Pi as a way to stay alive. So mm-hmm. it's these people who open themselves. It's a very intimate, right. it's like a priest getting a, a confession. It's this very intimate mm-hmm. relationship where strangers open themselves up to you. And it's very, very moving. So I'd say ultimately it was the, 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 the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds I re- of letters I received from, from readers around the world. That's actually, to me, that's the mark of a successful book. If it's so touched people that they write back to you after you've, in a sense, in a sense written to them with your book. That mm-hmm. reciprocity was the most touching thing. Yeah, that's incredible. It's really, um, I think it's really started some interesting conversations in our club because we're a self-help book club. So generally what we c- cover is personal development and nonfiction. But at this time of year, I try and choose a fiction book because um, I feel like instead of giving people homework and like doing exercise and things, it's good to just read a great story and a great allegory, I suppose, and reflect on your, on yourself and reflect on how the themes, um, what they could mean for you. Yeah, so that's that's really what's happening in, in our club as well. So it, it, it's brilliant for that. Well, um, a, great one, allegory, a great allegory is a great way to understand complex things. You know, a perfect yeah. example, for example, is 19, is sorry, is Animal Farm. You know, a delightful mm-hmm. little allegory about a farm. It's a great way to understand totalitarianism, Stalinism in Russia. So, you know, in terms of self-help, the, I think one of the great ways to help oneself is to get the right metaphors to help one understand complex things, whether those complexes yeah. are outside one or inside one. Mm, absolutely. Um, one of the questions I wanted you to, to ask you was, do you think this story has a happy ending? As in, do you think Life of Pi has a happy ending? But I don't know if we can answer that without 
sharing the ending. Um, well, um, well, first of all, we know Pi survives. I said already that he was at sea for 227 days, but that wasn't, it wasn't a quite, I, the idea of the book was not creating a work of suspense where you would wonder uh, whether he would survive. Yes, he survives, but the question is, how does he survive? Yeah. Not just literally in the Pacific, but overall, how does he survive with what he's lived through? Um, and in that sense, I don't know if I use the word happy, but he certainly achieves acceptance and contentment. Uh, of, of his life and moves on, yeah, moves on. So I guess, yes, yes, it does have, in fact, I say that at one point in the novel, this story has a happy mm. ending. Mm. But well, accept, well, acceptance and contentment is great. It's that that's what we should, that's what probably we're all aiming for, even though we we don't realize it, right? That's, that's, well, you don't want it's an kind ideal. of overrated. You don't want to search too much for an ideal because nothing can be perfect in life. You want what's good enough. So mm. I think, I said the last words of part one of the novel is this story has a happy ending by which I mean that he does uh, get to that point of contentment and therefore abil ability to let go. Mm, yeah. Um, what do you think has been your biggest gift from Life of Pi as an author, as a human, as a storyteller? Oh, it's, as I said, it was nice to have a story that connected with so many people. Uh, it's not given to all books. I mean, some bad books connect with a lot of people, some very good books connect with very few people. Um, what was mm -hmm. nice about Life of Pi was the degree of connection with so many people. Um, so many years on, that was a, it was a, in fact, it's a proper thing. Art is a gift to the world to have people take that gift, open it up and say, oh, thank you very much. It was deeply, deeply gratifying uh, to have done that. And that's the very purpose of art and indeed of religion is to reach out and connect with the other. Mm, sure. And what about the biggest challenge from, through the, from the whole process? Um, there weren't any, any, and this is a case where I had a, a an idea that really thrilled me. Don't forget, as the writer, you're the first reader. So as I was writing Life of Pi, I was reading Life of Pi, and Christ, I really liked this book. It was really good. I was really enjoying this book. It was a mixture of storytelling but depth to it. You don't want just pure entertainment, because pure entertainment is like sugar. You digest it quickly, you get a high, then you forget it. You don't want something mm -hmm. that's too emotional, too plot-driven. Because then, it, you know, you know, Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, marvelous entertainment. No one can remember the ending of the book because you have this great, tremendous locomotive, but then the train station at the end is not worth the trip, really. So you want a mixture of entertainment, but something you have to think about. So getting mm. that right balance for me was really thrilling. It wasn't a challenge. I have to say that, as I said, this was an easy book. It was like in golf, where you hit that ball right, it makes that little noise that's very satisfying, and the ball goes off and does a nice little arc and lands next to your hole. Life of Pi was sort of like that. It was, uh, I just happened to hit the ball really well and it got very, very close. In fact, it was a hole in one. It was very nice. It was like a hole in one in golf. So it doesn't happen yeah. often, but I got it that one time. I got a hole in one with Life of Pi mm -hmm. and there were no challenges. Um, yeah, I said 20 years on, I'm still happy occasionally to talk about it. I've moved on creatively, as I said. There are, yeah. uh, there's Beaches and Virgil, High Mountains of Portugal, and now this one. This is my third novel since Life of Pi but it's still impacting so many people which is brilliant yeah, um absolutely. just a final few questions then from our um for our, our uh, members today you just mentioned that there's, there's some good books that um don't connect with enough people maybe um can you recommend any or do you have any fiction and non-fiction books that you would recommend at the moment oh there's a wonderful since you're uh yeah there's a wonderful non-fiction book called the gift mm -hmm. the gift by lewis hyde Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, Hyde, H-Y-D-E. And in it, right, Lewis exactly. Hyde discusses the idea of the gift, the idea of giving something, what that might mean. And it's a, it's a really luminous book about the idea of giving, because we live in a society, especially in the West, that is so driven by capitalism. Everything is commodified. Mm. Children are commodified. Women are commodified. Everything is commodified. It's appalling. Um, there's very few spaces for nothing where things are done for nothing. Religion is still one of them. You know, you still have to, you know, tithe, but that's voluntary. It's not inherent to religion. There's very few spaces where things are done for free. That's why volunteering can be so gratifying because for once you're doing something for nothing. What is more mm -hmm. wonderful than you're walking down the street and someone says, excuse me, I'm lost. Where is, so where is Smith yeah. Street? <gasps> Isn't it wonderful to say, oh, Smith Street is over there. Take a left, here, I'll walk with you. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to be able to help someone for nothing, because then we really connect to who we are as human beings. So the gift, yeah. the, uh, Lewis Hyde explores the idea of giving for nothing. And how, in fact, when you give for nothing, you receive everything. And it, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's, um, it is so against the, 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 the ethos of capitalism 
uh, mm. and, and go back to it. So it's a wonderful book called The Gift by, uh, by Lewis Hyde, I would say. And otherwise you ask, you know, I'd recommend a great book of fiction. Well, it's funny how these old books sometimes we think uh, aren't gonna last the course, but I think one of the books that changed me the most, oddly enough, was The Divine Comedy by Dante. Mm. So this classic from the 14th century. I mean, Christ, how old can you get? In a good translation, <laughs> the one that I read was by um, John Ciardi, an American poet called John Ciardi, C-I-A-R-D-I. -I. It's a really good translation. You know, in, in the Divine Comedy, Dante has lost his way. It's a metaphor for life. He's lost his way. And the only way he can get to where he needs to go is he has to travel all the way through hell, through purgatory, and through heaven. So it's this fantastical allegory, really worked out. It all takes place on one day, Christmas, Easter day of the year 1300. And it is so meticulous. The stars, the way he looks at them, are the way they would have been on Easter Day of the year 1300. He meets hundreds of people, some heinously evil, some sort of all right and some wonderfully good. It's an extraordinary trip. It's such a work of literature. It's a cathedral of a work of literature. So it's not one that you just read in the subway for five minutes. You do have to um, give yourself over to it. But the rewards are mm -hmm. immense. It's one of the great, great, great classics of, if you can read Italian even better, I can't. So you have to have a, a great translation. Um, same thing with the Iliad, actually. I, my next novel is inspired by the Iliad. And it was because I had the luck of reading a good translation. You could read a translation of the Iliad that are really stultifying. They're academic and they're boring. They just, I read mm -hmm. one by an American translator named Stephen Mitchell. And he really cut away at all the fat and just lean, mean story. It's like Game of Thrones without the sex. It's really, really violent, really vivid characters. And it's unbelievably contemporary. It, even mm. though it's basically the first book in the West, literally the first book in the West, the first written book in Greek in 800 BC, literally the first book in the West, it's still completely relevant. It's, the, the, it's all about anger. and God, we live in a society of angry people. Look at Brexit. It's, it's all about anger and the consequences of anger and what do you do with anger? So it's completely irrelevant. It's so 22nd century, they should read it in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an extraordinary book. And a perfect example of a great book, what literature can do. I sent my, uh, I had a prime minister here called Stephen Harper. He's one of these tight little narrow white men who rule our world in a very bad way. And, and it came out that he doesn't read. And so mm -hmm. I, for four years, I sent him a book every two weeks to try to open up his narrow little mind. And the very first book I sent him was The Death of Ivan Illich by Leo Tolstoy, which is only 70 pages long about this man named Ivan Illich who bangs his side putting up a curtain rod one day and it creates a little bruise and the bruise doesn't go away and it becomes a tumor and he slowly dies. And it's about what it feels like to die and the effect on the people around him. His, his wife, soon to be his widow, is only worried about his, her pension. And his friends who are card players worry that if he dies, they won't have the fourth person they need at their card game. Everyone is unbelievably selfish. There's only mm -hmm. one person who's kind to, to Ivan Illich, and it's a character named Gerasim, who's a servant. And he comes to see Ivan Illich, and Ivan Illich is saying, you know, I'm in pain. And Gerasim says, well, what can I do, master? And Ivan Illich says, well, you know what? If you lift my legs, it feels good. So immediately Gerasim puts his master's feet on his shoulders. And Ivan says, oh, Gerasim, you have other things to do. And he says, no, no, master, I'm happy to make you feel better. That's important. He's the only person who connects with Ivan Ilyich while he is suffering. So it's a book that's both funny and horrifying. And it's mm. only seven pages long. It tells you exactly this is the power of story. So if you wanted one book to convince you to what stories can do to you, they're not just entertainment. It's not just Netflix on the page. Mm. It's something like The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Amazing. Um, were those books read, read, do you think? Do you know? Well, you know, it, it turned out to be a book. There's a book out there called 101 Letters to a Prime Minister, letter, the complete letters to Stephen Harper. For four years, every two weeks, I sent him a book with a letter explaining why he might read that book. And I chose all kinds of stuff. It wasn't just Canadian fiction. It was all over the world, all languages and translation, obviously, generally short, because usually the excuse people give for not reading is that they're busy. Yeah. But you have a bed, you have a bedside table, you can surely read a few pages a day. So I gave him short books, under 200 pages. Uh, no, he never answered. I got seven letters from his correspondence staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you write to uh, Prime Minister Sunak, you're going to get a reply from his correspondence. You know, it'll be three letters saying, you know, dear Miss Jones, thank you for writing about the conditions of the roads in Norwich. Be assured that the Prime Minister made of your concerns. Thank you very much. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, I got seven letters like that, but none from the man himself, even though, you know, I was well known enough then. I'd won the booker. Here I was trying to get, engage in a dialogue with this Prime Minister. And that tight little man never, never, ever wrote back to me. Mm. 
wonder what the lesson is there. <laughs> mm. You know, during, during, the night, was, during one of the elections, he was asked what his favorite book was. And can you believe the man said the Guinness Book of World Records? <laughs> No, I can believe that. Well, I can now after old. what you just told me, but <laughs> I believe that if I was a 14 year old boy, but a 50 year old prime minister, the Guinness Book of World Records, honestly, that's your favorite book. Uh, <laughs> Is that you when you gave up? Mind? Yeah. <laughs> Not that reading books necessarily makes you a better look at the, look at uh, uh, your baboon there, Boris Johnson, certainly a man who's read. But if you misread everything, if you don't bring your heart to what you read, you will be a foolish buffoon the way uh, um, Boris Johnson is. Um, well, we're all about, you, yeah, information uh, into transformation, isn't it? It's actually using and applying what you're reading and learning. And that's what we're yeah trying to do. Um, it's 8.02 p.m. So I'm aware of the time. So I'm going to bring this to a close. Um, but what a treat to be able to spend the last hour with you. Yeah. And thank you so much. And you guys at home. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so what does the rest of the day look like for you today? Yeah. Well, it's 2.02. I have to pick up my children at three o'clock or two of them at three o'clock and two of them at 318. So I'm going to bring them home and then I'm likely going to go to the gym. And like, it's, a real, it's like it's a glamour behind the Booker Prize winning life, right? <laughs> my real are life. so not impressed by the fact that I wrote Life of Pi. They sort of rolled their <laughs> eyes and oh, Life of Pi. Although my daughter's thrilled that I'm going with her to Boston. I, I've decided to take her to Boston. So we're going for five days to Boston. Just to see the play. Me to Boston. It's going to be a wonderful father-daughter trip. Um, although it was quite cute that she was she's in a choir and at age, age 11 Lola my daughter has finally decided to read Life of Pi she's the only one of my children who's my 13 year old has not read it yet so she decided to read so she was reading during the choir practice they had a bit of a break and they're supposed to bring something to do so she was brought Life of Pi and someone said oh Life of Pi you know the author was just here he was just here a few minutes ago and she's yeah I know he's my dad so that's a rare time when she's kind of ooh impressed that I wrote Life of Pi otherwise it like, makes their eyes roll <laughs> That's so cool. Gone. Yeah, to be able to name drop. Yeah. Thank you dad. so much. Yeah, my um, pleasure. Some of us are going to see the play actually in London in December. It's our uh, kind of group outing. So we're very much looking forward to that. But yeah, thank you so much. Um, have a nice day, Jan. Have a great night, everybody else who's in the UK. Um, please, stay, please stay in touch with me and each other in the app. And um, good night. Goodbye. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.